What's going on everyone? In this video, I'm gonna cover kind of the basics that you need to know about SystemD, both theoretically and practically, like how you're going to be interacting with SystemD when it is your system's init process. Firstly, what is init? I'm just very quickly gonna cover that. We're gonna talk about how SystemD kind of works, the main ideas that you need to know to work with SystemD, we're going to cover units, we're going to cover system CTL, we're going to cover system D targets, and we're going to cover kind of the relationships between different system D units, what you might think of as services right now, um, and how system D handles dependencies and execution order. You're also going to get all the ingredients that you need to like make a service in system D and manage it. So long story short, init is a special process that is started by the kernel it's a special process because it's the first process that really gets started by the kernel during boot the process id or pid is one and it's a process that not only is it responsible for kind of booting the rest of the system and getting the system to a state where things are working people can log in etc but in addition to starting services and getting the system there it's also a long running process that kind of has some power over other processes. For example, when a process is orphaned because its parent process dies, um, it is reparented under init. So it's kind of the ultimate mommy on the system. It takes care of orphans. It kills zombie processes. It's kind of responsible for process stuff that can go wrong um, during the normal operation of a system. Init used to be a series of plain text scripts essentially in etc or etsy init.d um, that's what's known as sys5 style init or you might see it written as sysv style init that's kind of the the older unix way of doing it you have a bunch of plain text scripts that get run essentially in order the user can kind of munge that order around but long story short there were some drawbacks to that and uh, systemd has kind of replaced how that works in Linux. It is not a Unix uh, init system. It is at this point purely in Linux. So really when you think of system D, think it's init, but it also kind of handles all system state and service stuff during boot and then during the time that that system is up and running. What is system D? It's really a collection of programs and libraries. It's not even just one binary. You have the system CTL commands for interacting with it. You have journal CTL. You have a bunch of tooling around that. Um, it, in fact, it does so much more than it. it it's sort of an, a, an agglomeration of process management, network management through network D, logins through login D, and logs that your services then emit through journal D. And those are no longer plain text logs. They're, they're binary files, which has some advantages and some disadvantages. So it's a bunch of stuff, and that's what you have to know about systemd before you actually start using it. Systemd units. Uh, what is a systemd unit? Well, a unit is really what you might have called a service before on an older style of uh, init. Um, it's a unit is any entity managed by systemd, and that can be a bunch of different things. Yes, it's services for sure. So it's programs that run, you know, that are long running, that are run as a service. It can also be socket files that like need to exist for something. It can be devices. You can have a systemd unit that kind of defines a device and needs to make sure that that device is there in the right order. Um, it can be a mount point or an auto mount point. It can be a swap file. It can be a partition. It can be a startup target, which we'll talk about a little bit later in a separate section. Targets are basically they're kind of the, the systemd equivalent of run levels, but they're named, so they're kind of like a named run level. It could be a watched file system path. You can define that as a unit um, that lets you manage something like saying, oh, you know, my console service unit can require a file system path, like opt console if that's on a shared file system or something. Like I can require that that's there before I start my service. It comes in handy. And lastly, it can be a group of externally created processes, which we're not going to get into in this video. Long story short, it's much more than just service management. It's dependency management and requirement management and target management uh, of all kinds of different entities. Let's talk about where these unit files are actually kept. There's a few different places. Lib systemd system is where 
your kind of standard default unit files are kept. This is like you boot your system the first time. This is what your distro people creators put in place there. There's user lib system D system, which as you might guess from user lib, that is where locally installed packages, like after the first time you booted the system, you installed some packages. If they have system D unit files that go along with them, that's the canonical place to put those. So put there by your package manager or more realistically that your packagers for your software. There's run systemd system for transient or temporary files. I'm listing it not because I've used it, but only because it's part of the official documentation. And finally, and this is the really important one for you, is Etsy systemd system. Etsy systemd system has all of your uh, kind of locally configured uh, stuff. You can see it has the, the targets there. So if you're manually creating a systemd unit file for this system, this is where you put it, you put it in here. So you would you know, have it be at Etsy systemd system, I don't know, uh, console.service. For example, for the record, Etsy has the highest priority. So it also overrides things in the other uh, kind of locations. Let's write a very basic systemd unit file just so that you've seen one. We're gonna go into the details of this much more later. But if you wanted to write an extremely simple systemd unit file, here's how you would do it. You would because it's a custom unit file, it goes in Etsy, systemd system, and then whatever your service is called, uh, service. And it's a service, so we'll use that file ending. I'm just gonna write this quickly and then talk you through it. So we have a unit section that can contain a description and some other stuff about this unit file. Specifically, uh, maybe in our case, we'll have a network service, so we'll say, after the network is up, we'll talk about targets a little bit later. We're gonna have a very simple service section that just has an exact start um, defined uh, with just the path to my program. We're just gonna assume that something like that is there and then start it. And we're gonna assume this is a, a server and it's gonna target multi-user by default. So basically when the system is up and multi-user login is available, like the state that a healthily booted Linux server is in, we want this unit to be included in that. So you're not finished booting until you've done, uh, until you've started this unit. We're gonna go ahead and save that. And you'll notice that you can't actually um, find this. Oh my God, did it automatically load? That's incredible. Um, I'm used to having to do, and it's I think it's still a good practice to do systemctl daemon reload. And what that does is it makes systemd reread all unit files. So they get reloaded, reparsed by systemd. It does not restart units. So if you change, uh, like if I make some changes to this so while I'm kind of building and troubleshooting and starting it and testing it, so, uh, doing, you know, making updates and then doing a daemon reload would not restart that service, so it would still have the old config. So make sure that you do a systemctl restart your service name if it is, if you want it to kind of reread the new unit file config. But that is a very, very simple service uh, that is valid as long as long as you have this Dave program, which I do not have on this machine, but it could even just be a script. So let's inspect the unit file for Nginx. To do that, we're gonna just look at the status of Nginx. We know it's registered with systemd, that is loaded. And that gives us a path to that unit's unit file. In this case, it's in lib systemd system. This saves you, because there's four or five locations where uh, systemd likes to put things or unit files, um, this is the easiest way to, uh, to find something. So now we can just use less to inspect that file and we can start looking at it. Now, the syntax, it's a really simple, uh, almost like, I don't know, is this sort of an any file syntax? Um, comments are hash marks just like in any bash script. And so this is all pretty self-explanatory. There's nothing super complicated in these, although there are a ton of options. Like this is only a small amount of options. This is, I think, a good example to kind of look. So you have some comments here about what signals Nginx will uh, respect and how it will behave when you um, 
send different signals to it. I'm not going to go through all this for because we're not learning about Nginx here, but this basically says, hey, look, I'm defining a new system D unit. It takes uh, a description. This is optional. And here's, here's the important thing. This says, and we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later, this just says this unit should come up. So system D as you're booting, if this is enabled, bring it up only after the network target has been reached. So only after we have networking does it make sense to start network services like Nginx, right? It's a web server. Now in the service um, section, you can kind of specify what, what type of process this is going to be, which kind of means how it's going to be managed. In this case, it's type uh, forking, which means the main process is going to start um, because Nginx needs to bind to port 80, which is a, a, it's one of the first 1024 ports, which means it's a privileged port, which means it needs to be run uh, or opened by root. So Nginx starts with more privileges, grabs the port, forks, and creates child processes that are actually going to handle traffic. And then, you know, with lower privileges, once it has that port, it doesn't need those privileges to open new ports anymore. And the main process, the process you started, exited, and then you have child processes. Anyway, it's it's one very common type of kind of service canonical way of doing a service in Linux. So here you have a type forking, which means, hey, the, the process you start isn't going to be around, even though Nginx will still be up. So don't expect the main process to stick around. It'll exit. And then this is the second argument that goes with a, a forking type where, well, fine, if if the main process, if, if systemd can't depend on the main process that it starts continuing to be up, how does it know? Well, it knows because Nginx promises to put a PID file into run nginx.pid. Little Linux trivia there for you. Uh, you can execute things before the process starts. You usually want, uh, actually, I think you even need an exec start configuration directive here where it's like, what is the command for actually starting this service? And you can tell it's just, this is just how you would execute the binary from the command line, right? Here's, uh, this is optional. If you send a reload, systemctl reload, how does Nginx behave? Well, what command gets run? You can see it's just it's just running the command again with some different um, options in this case. Nginx knows about a reload, so you can just do a dash s reload. And then exec stop, systemd will try a few things to stop a process, but if you have a way of cleaning up or a, a special option or something, you can see there's this spin start stop daemon that it uses. This is this is how the creators of Nginx, or at least the creators of this unit file, want Nginx to be stopped. So that's what you, again, this is optional. Finally, the install section tells us, or tells systemd really, when, at what point should this unit be running? What wants this? So this is like a realistic, I mean, very realistic. It's one of the most popular Linux services there is. Uh, unit files. I think it's a, it gives you a good example of a lot of stuff, including comments and like weird kill behaviors or signal behaviors, but not all of these things are required. So now that you've seen all this and you know this basic theory, you are ready to learn about systemctl, the actual practical command for working with systemd.